thank Ron Borders um, and Cecil, who I served with both of them in the House of Representatives. And, um, you know, um, I personally believe you're much better off with people at the state level making the decisions. And I can tell you, um, Ron and I are good friends, have been, will continue to be, even though we're in different parties. And if you look at the state budget, I think it passed 180 to nothing, and it was balanced and in Washington. Had the first budget that we've had in, uh, in six years this year. So you as a citizen, regardless of which side of the political uh, equation you're on, you're much better off with, with people at the state and local level having more to do with where, where your tax dollars are spent than in Washington. Yes, sir. Easy. <laughs> I don't think everyone realizes how large geographically South Georgia congressional districts are. Can you explain to the room what area of Georgia you actually have to cover? So um, we have we have 24 counties, and so we'll go from the Florida line north to uh, Jones County. So we'll just stop just south of the Atlanta suburbs. It is essentially the I-75 corridor. Um, and Jones County being just above Monday. County just above me, and um, so uh, Robbins Air Force Base, obviously the largest industrial complex in, in Georgia, is the largest employer in the district. And, and the good thing about that is, uh, Moody's an Air Force Base too. And so when I'm in there meeting with the generals about Robbins, I can meet with them about Moody, and when I'm meeting with them about Moody, I can talk with them about Robbins. And uh, as, as a member of the Armed Services Committee. They recognize that anything, anything that they want legislatively uh, is going to come through the Armed Services Committee. And, and I, I spoke to Saxby earlier today. It's, uh, you know, we don't have a member of the Armed Services Committee on in the Senate anymore uh, since Saxby left. And uh, Hank Johnson and myself are, are the two members from Georgia uh, that, that are on the committee. I think about the main military installations that we have, thanks to the Democrat. I look forward to one of our senators getting put on the Armed Services Committee because we can put them down there as well. Yes, sir. What are your feelings concerning the reduction in numbers of our armed forces? I, I think it's absolutely ridiculous to be engaged in as many conflicts as we're engaged in. <laughs> And, and to be looking at the things that are going on in the world, and you look at the aggression of Russia, and and the potential that um, that Putin would would breach a NATO ally's borders, I quite honestly think it makes us look very weak in what we're doing right now. Um, you know that. That's the way I feel about it. I mean, it, it's, uh, I think it's contrary to the long-term interest of national security and global peace, quite honestly. He was first, sorry. Who, me? Yes, sir. Okay. I just had a comment. Uh, I'd just like to thank you and Alice and your office for the hard work with the Veterans Administration. Well, thank you. Good job. And, uh, we, we've got a good leader in, in uh, the, the new leader in Dublin, Mary Alice, she's a sharp lady. She was a captain in the Navy. She almost broke my hand when she shook it. Um, and, and she's a good leader. And one of the keys to fixing the issues with the Veterans Administration is, is making sure, just like anything else, that we put good leaders in place at the local level and that we let them run their operations and that we don't try to micromanage. Yes, ma'am. Um, I ha also have a variety of problems with health care law as it stands today. Um, I was wondering, would you consider um, removing the age requirement for Medicare so that anybody that wanted to join up with Medicare could, and people who wanted to have private insurance could have that, but just to remove the age limit on Medicare? Uh, you, you know, the answer to that is no. And the reason for that is that, act, that Medicare is not actuarially sound today. And so. As, as we talk about balancing the budget and going forward, there are things that people have paid for. Uh, Social Security, Medicare, veterans benefits are those things that people have either paid for or earned. And 
we need to make sure that we secure those current programs before we do uh, other things. And so typically someone has paid into the Medicare system for 30 or 40 years before they become eligible for the for Medicare. And, um, and, and, and that's how it's been paid for. If you made it eligible for, for everybody, I think that you would probably break the system uh, in, in short order. I have concern when I hear the uh, talk about minimum wage, uh, raising it to $15 an hour, making that federal minimum wage. I'm a small business owner with a, a business that employs people, pay them, we pay them more than minimum wage, but if we were to be forced to pay $15 an hour, uh, my little business probably wouldn't be here because there's just no way people could support uh, what I have to charge for me to help them. I'm in the home care business. So I'm just your take on that. So it, it's not just when you talk about home care, it's not just the wage, it's the way you have to calculate the hours as well. Um, I made minimum wage uh, in my life. I was, when I was in college, when I was in high school, when I worked on the farm in college and high school, I made minimum wage. And so it, it's something that, sure, I would have liked to have been paid more, and the fact of the matter is, I might not have had the job either. And so that, that wage rate is not meant to be the rate that, that you live off of or that provides for a family. It's supposed to be that rate that, um, that you're able to get that job and start that job and, and hopefully live up pretty fast. Most people who show up to work on time and do their job we're going to move out of that wage rate extremely, extremely fast. Um, I will tell you that the reason I think this should be a state issue instead of a federal issue, the cost of living in, in New York City or in San Francisco is much different than it is in Valdosta, Georgia. And from a competitive standpoint, when we're talking about bringing industry to our part of the country, one of the things that we talk about is how competitive it is, how competitive we are with regard to the total cost of business. If you set the minimum wage in Georgia at the same thing that it is in New York cities or other cities where it, where it costs so much more to live, it's going to put us at, at, at a disadvantage in some cases. So I very much think it should be a state, a state issue way they're forcing the change they're making with how uh, you calculate hours on, on home health care in your industry is going to have a tremendous impact on, on the consumer and, and in many cases some of your people aren't, simply aren't going to get the care because they can't afford to pay the rate and that rate in the end what you pay your employees in the end is paid by, by your customers. So, so some of the things they did I think their intent was somewhat geared towards the fast food industry. Almost um, is actually having issues with, with banks and other people that are now going to be required to make their managers um, come in and clock in, which is something they don't.